Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Megan Bedstead, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore and our co-sponsor, Boston Review, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this evening's event with Martha C. Nussbaum, discussing her latest book, The Monarchy of Fear, A Philosopher Looks at Our Political Crisis. This evening's talk is the start of a very busy fall event schedule here at Harvard Bookstore. Tickets are on sale now for upcoming discussions with Gary Steinberg, John Kerry, Bruce Schneer, Anand Giriharda, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Jill Lepore, and many others. For more information and the rest of our schedule, check out harvard.com slash events. This event is co-sponsored by Boston Review, a political and literary forum that puts a range of voices and views in dialogue on the web, in print, and at public events like this. Tonight's talk will conclude with some time for your questions, followed by a book signing right here on stage. The signing line will form down this aisle to my right and extending out into the hallway where we have books available for sale. I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to anyone who purchases, purchases a book here tonight. By doing so, you are supporting a local independent bookstore and ensuring the future of this author series. So we thank you. And I'd also like to remind everyone to please silence your cell phones for the talk. And now, I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Martha Nussbaum is the Ernst Freund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics, appointed in the Philosophy Department and the Law School at the University of Chicago. She gave the 2016 Jefferson Lecture for the National Endowment for the Humanities, the highest honor the federal government bestows for a distinguished intellectual achievement in the humanities. She also won the 2016 Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy, which is regarded as the most prestigious award available in fields that are not eligible for a Nobel. She has written more than 22 books, including Upheavals of Thought, Anger and Forgiveness, Not for Profit, and many more. Tonight, she'll be discussing her latest book, The Monarchy of Fear. Publishers Weekly calls it an erudite but very readable investigation that engages figures from Aristotle to Donald Trump in lucid and engaging prose. The New York Times Book Review writes, an elegant and precise stylus, Nussbaum writes about gut feelings like envy and disgust with an air of serene lucidity. She pushes you to slow down, think harder, and re revisit your knee-jerk assumptions. We are so pleased to host her here at the Cambridge Public Library tonight. Please join me in welcoming Martha Nussbaum. Really, a great pleasure. This is like a stone throw from 18 Ware Street, where I lived the first year that I was a graduate student at Harvard. So it really is like old home territory. And I'm particularly happy to be hosted by the Harvard Bookstore, which is, as, as she said, a, one of the most wonderful independent bookstores, and by the Boston Review, which is a publication that I have been associated with for a long time, and I do think it's the most intelligent, diverse journal of ideas in the country today. So I'm very proud to, in a way, represent the Boston Review. Election night 2016 was bright daylight for me in Kyoto, where I had just arrived for an award ceremony after a happy send-off from my colleagues back home. I was feeling anxious about the bitterly divided electorate, and yet reasonably confident that appeals to fear and anger would be repudiated, although there would certainly be a lot of work to do to bring the country back together. <coughs> my Japanese hosts came in and out of my hotel room, explaining the schedule of the various ceremonial events. In the background of these conversations on TV, but in the forefront of my mind, the election news kept coming in, producing first increasing alarm, and then finally both grief and a deeper fear for the country and its people and institutions. I was aware that my fear was not balanced or fair-minded, so I was part of the problem that I was worried about. By the time the election result was clear, I had to go out to have my first official meeting at the offices of the Inamori Foundation. So I dressed up in a cheerful, 
a night in a blue suit and um, fix my hair and try to express happiness and gratitude. The first official dinner was quite a chore. Social conversation with strangers, filtered through an interpreter, offered no distracting charms. I wanted to hug my friends, but they were far away. That night, the combination of isolation, political anxiety, and jet lag made sleep somewhat more difficult than usual, so I began thinking, deciding around midnight that my previous work on the emotions had not gone deep enough. As I examined my own fear, it gradually dawned on me that fear was actually the problem a nebulous and multiform fear suffusing American society. I got uh, some ideas, tentative but a little bit promising, about how fear is connected to and renders toxic other emotions such as anger, disgust, and envy. I rarely work in the middle of the night, uh, but jet lag and the national crisis have a way of changing habit. And in this case, I had a beginning an incipient sense of discovery, so I went back to sleep with at least some optimism and I set myself to write this book. There's a lot of fear around in America today, and this fear is often mingled indeed with anger, blame, and envy. Fear all too often blocks rational deliberation, poisons hope, and impedes constructive cooperation for a better future. What is this fear about? Many Americans feel themselves powerless, out of control of their own lives. They fear for their own future and that of their loved ones. They fear that that nebulous fantasy, the American dream, that hope that your children will flourish and do better than you have done, has died, and that everything has slipped away from them. These feelings have their basis in real problems. Among others, income stagnation in the lower middle class, technological change affecting employment opportunities, alarming declines in the health and longevity of members of the lower middle class, especially men, and the escalating cost of higher education at the very time that a college degree is increasingly needed for employment. But real problems are difficult to solve, and their solution takes long, hard study, and cooperative work toward an uncertain future. It's all too easy to convert that sense of panic and helplessness into blame of outsider groups, such as immigrants, racial minorities, and women. They have taken our jobs. They are infesting our country. Fear leads them to aggressive othering strategies rather than to useful analysis. At the same time, fear also runs rampant among people on the left who seek greater economic equality and the vigorous protection of hard-won rights for women and minorities. These are, of course, laudable and essential goals. But it doesn't exactly help to react as if the end of the world is at hand. Once again, it's not that the problems aren't real and important, but fear leads, in this case too, to aggressive othering rather than dialogue. Rather than analyze matters soberly and listen to the other side, trying to sort things through, my students all too often demonize an entire half of the American electorate. As in the book of Revelation, these are the last days when a righteous remnant must contend against satanic forces. We all need first, I think, to take a deep breath and recall our own history. When I was a little girl, African Americans were being lynched in the South, communists were losing their jobs, women were just beginning to enter prestigious universities and the workforce, and sexual harassment was a ubiquitous offense that had no name and no laws to constrain it. Jews could not win partnerships in major US law firms. Gays and lesbians, criminals under the law, were almost always in the closet. People with disabilities had no rights to public space and public education. 
transgender was a category that had as yet also no name. America, in short, was far from beautiful. These facts tell us two things my students need to remember. First, the America for which they're nostalgic never existed, not fully. It was a work in progress, a set of dynamic aspirations put in motion by tough work, cooperation, hope, and solidarity over a long period of time. A just and inclusive America never was and is not yet a fully achieved reality. Second, this present moment may look like backsliding from our march toward human equality, and in a way it seems to be that, but it's not the apocalypse, and it's actually a time when hope and cooperative work can accomplish a lot. We all remember FDR's statement, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And we recently heard departing President Obama say, democracy can buckle when we give way to fear. Now, in fact, he keeps repeating that, and I think audibly so, and so it's good to, to hear him do that. Roosevelt was wrong if we take his words literally. Although we did have reason to fear fear, we certainly had other things that we had reason to fear in that time, such as Nazism, hunger, and social conflict. Fear of those evils was rational, and to that extent, we shouldn't entirely fear our fear, though we should always examine it. But Obama's more precise and modest statement is surely right, giving way to fear, which means drifting with its currents, going where it leads us, refusing critical examination, is surely dangerous. We need to think hard about fear and where fear is leading us, but you might not be convinced so far that fear is really the problem to focus on for democratic self-government. So let me now imagine a little dialogue between myself and a defender of fear, whom I'll call D, and uh, you'll see that it, it channels the skeptical voices of many friends and, and colleagues who pose skeptical questions to me. Um, in particular. Uh, okay, so Dee says, but surely we don't want to extinguish fear. Without fear, we'd all be dead. Fear is useful, propelling us into life-saving action. I say, oh, of course you're right there, but fear has a strong tendency to get ahead of us, propelling us into <laughs> selfish, heedless, and antisocial actions. I'll try to show you that this tendency comes from its evolutionary history and its psychological structure. More than other emotions, fear needs careful scrutiny if it's not to turn poisonous. So then D says, well, I'll need to be convinced. But I also want to know right now why you say that fear is particularly dangerous for democratic self-government. Surely democracies are often well advised to consult fear in thinking of how to structure a of institutions. Isn't our defense establishment a sensible response to legitimate fears of foreign domination? And what about our Constitution? Weren't the framers guided by fear when they wrote the Bill of Rights? After all, they wrote down all the things that the British had violated or taken from them. Their fear that similar things would happen in the new nation gave good, not bad, guidance to democracy. So Martha says, it would be stupid to deny that fear often gives good guidance. But your examples involve fear filtered by careful and extended public deliberation. You've omitted hasty and ill-justified military campaigns. You've omitted cases where rights were unequally bestowed or privileges hastily curtailed as a result of popular fear. We have a national habit of scapegoating on popular people in times of national stress and abridging their rights. Eugene Debs was thrown into prison for peaceful speeches opposing U.S. involvement in World War I. Loyal and peaceful Japanese Americans were interned in camps. These are cases where fear not only did not lead in the direction of rights, but actually abridged rights that were already established and the same climate of fear prevented even our courts from seeing that at the time. Fear has a way of running ahead of careful thought. 
Fear of that sort undermines fraternity, poisons cooperation, and makes us do things that we're ashamed of later. Dee says, well, once again, I await your argument. You've persuaded me that there's a problem, but I don't yet see how large it is. But here's another thing. You use the title, The Monarchy of Fear, and you keep saying that fear poses a special problem for democratic self-government. What I don't get is the particular connection you draw between fear and the threat to democracy. To the extent that fear is a problem, doesn't it threaten all governments equally? So Martha says, well, not, actually not so much. <laughs> In an absolute monarchy, the monarch, of course, cannot be excessively fearful, but monarchs feed on fear from below. Fear of the monarch's punishment ensures compliance, and fear of outside threats ensures voluntary servitude. Fearful people want protection and care. They turn to a strong, absolute ruler in search of that care. In a democracy, by contrast, we need to look one another in the eye as equals. And this means that a horizontal trust must connect citizens. Trust is not just reliance. Slaves can rely on the master's brutal behavior. But of course, they do not trust the master. Trust means being willing to be exposed, to allow your own future to lie in the hands of your fellow citizens. Absolute monarchs don't want or need trust. Think again about marriage. In an old style marriage in which the male head of the household was sort of like a monarch, there was no need for trust. Spouse and children just had to obey. But the marriages to which people typically aspire now are more balanced requiring reciprocity and trust on both sides. And trust is undermined by fear. To the extent that I see you as a threat to my life and my goals, I will protect myself against you, and I will strategize or even dissemble rather than trust it. So too in politics. That refusal of trust is happening all over the country now. My students, don't want to trust anyone who voted for Trump, and they view such people as like a hostile force within the university. Many Trump supporters return the compliment, seeing students and universities as subversive enemies of the people. And here's another side to the connection. When people feel fearful, they grasp after control. They can't stand to wait to see how things play out. They need to make other people do what they want them to do. So when they're not seeking a benign monarch to protect them, they are all too likely to behave monarchically themselves, trying to control others. In this way, too, fear erodes the sort of reciprocity that's needed if democracies are to survive. And it leads to retributive anger, which divides when what is most needed is a constructive approach to an uncertain future. So D, uh, then, who's been quiet too long, says, you mentioned anger. This makes me ask another question. Why this emphasis on fear? Aren't there many emotions that threaten democracy? What about anger, in fact? Shouldn't we worry about that emotion even more than about fear, given its aggressive tendencies? People also think of envy as a major threat to democracy, fomenting class conflict. Finally, there's been a lot written about the role of disgust in racism and other forms of stigma and discrimination. Martha says, well, you're entirely right there, and the chapters of this book will indeed address these different emotions and their interconnections. But having worked for many years on each emotion more or less in isolation from the others, I've come to realize that my previous strategy obscured some very important causal relations among the emotions. So I'll try to convince you that fear is primary, both genetically and causally, and that it's because of infection by fear that the three other emotions you name turn toxic and threaten democracy. Yes, sure, people strike back out of a perceived sense of unfairness, but what is that exactly? Where does it come from? Why do people feel this way? And under what conditions does 
blame become politically toxic? These are the sorts of questions I think we need to ask about each emotion, and I believe they all lead back in the end to fear. The, well, but what about, what, what's all this fuss about emotions? Surely the big problems in American society are structural, and we need structural solutions which can be implemented through law whether people feel good about them or not. We don't have to wait for people to become better or more self-aware in order to fix the things that need fixing. Focusing on emotions could even distract us from the work that needs to be done. So then I say, well, I totally agree that laws and structures are crucial. I have views about these issues, which, which do emerge in the course of the book. But laws can't be enacted or sustained without the hearts and minds of people. In a monarchy, that's not the case. And all the monarch needs is enough fear to produce obedience. In a democracy, we need much more. Love of the good, hope for the future, a determination to combat the corrosive forces of hatred, disgust, and rage, all fed, I claim, by fear. Now, of course, he is not yet satisfied, nor should he, I say he because my it's really the voice of my co-author, Saul Levenmore, I think, more than anyone else. Um, since only assertions have been offered so far, not uh, argument or analysis. Still, Dee should now have a general sense of where my argument is headed. So let me just pause to briefly tell you how it unfolds. So there's first a chapter that describes the genetic primacy of fear uh, and its evolutionary primitiveness and then thinks about development of a child who might possibly, in certain circumstances, become capable of trust and reciprocity if the fear is properly kept under control. Then I turn to anger, and um, then I say that when, when we feel helpless and terribly afraid, we try to seize control through blame and othering and we propose sometimes quite ridiculous things uh, as a so-called solution to the problem, imagining that you know, building a wall would actually solve the problem of immigration and so on. And the anger then carries us toward retributive violence of a sort that does not solve the original problem, but actually makes the problem a great deal worse. So, so that's the so King really did think that the retributive part of anger was poison, and that it impeded constructive hope, work, and a kind of love that means love of the person, not, not liking them, but just having goodwill to them as persons. And so he, he urged people to keep the out, sense of outrage when things were wrong, but to discard the retributive side of the anger. So that's the chapter. Then there's a chapter on disgust and its role in discrimination and stigma. Again, fed by a, a, a strange kind of fear of our own embodiment and our own mortality. We then project those traits like decay, stench, and so on onto some subgroup that we want to subordinate. We say, oh, they're the animals were not really animals. And so, so I look at that kind of confused fantasy, which is all too real in social life, and its role in political subordination. Then I turn to envy, and uh, I think envy that you could uh, most quickly get a sense of where I'm going by thinking about the wonderful musical Hamilton, where I think Miranda is really onto something very profound when he showed the way in which the envy, which is the desire to spoil the good things that someone else has, uh, that, that is born of a terrible insecurity and a terrible fearfulness that Burr embodies in that musical. And so his bare desire to, to be in the room where it happens leads him to want to spoil Hamilton, who actually wants to do something and create something. And then, of course, he really does spoil that life. So that's um, an example that I turn to in that chapter, inhibited a little bit by the difficulty of 
quoting from the libretto of the musical, which they told me would cost too much and so on. But um, <laughs> you, you can all get the point. And finally, I go on to, uh, first of all, there's a chapter about misogyny, because I think one of the most striking features of the latest campaign was the way that all these emotions, anger and blame, disgust for the bodily fluids, and envy, all congeal in a, a kind of creepy misogyny. And uh, I talk about that, and I talk about some philosophical analyses of misogyny, and particularly a wonderful book by a young feminist philosopher, Kate Mann at Cornell. So, um, just uh, that's the low point of the book, but then I go on to have a final chapter on hope. And what, what is hope? How is it related to fear? It looks like it's sort of the same thing, because in both fear and hope, you're uncertain. You don't know how things are going to turn out, and the Stoics thought the both were equally bad, and you should get rid of both of them. But there is a difference, and I think this is a, it's another good young philosopher, Adrian Martin, at uh, Claremont McKenna, who's shown that in her very fine book on hope, namely that hope gets you set up to act in ways that produce or make it more likely that the good outcome will be produced. So I talk about that. I don't agree with everything she says, of course, but I, I really do think that's a very productive way of approaching it. And then, then I can talk about how we could flip the switch in ourselves from seeing the glass half empty to seeing it have full. What are the so-called practices of hope that we could come upon in our society? So, so now I'll just go back to the, I talked about philosophy, I think I've used that word about five times so far. So D might have a more fundamental question. Why should we turn to philosophy at all at this time of national crisis? What is philosophy and what does it have to offer us? Well, philosophy means many different things in many different historical traditions. But for me, philosophy is not about authoritative pronouncements. It's not about one person claiming to be deeper than others or making allegedly wise assertions. It's about leading what Socrates called the examined life, with humility about how little we really understand, with the commitment to arguments that are rigorous, reciprocal, and sincere, and with the willingness to listen to others as equal participants and to respond to what they offer. Philosophy in this Socratic conception does not compel or threaten or mock. It doesn't make bare assertions, but instead it sets up a structure of thought in which a conclusion follows from premises the interlocutor is perfectly free to dispute. Socrates questioned lots of people in the Athenian democracy. He found that all had the capacity for understanding and self-understanding. Plato dramatizes this in the Mino by showing Socrates questioning an illiterate and oppressed slave boy, and suitably prompted, the boy comes up with a very sophisticated geometrical proof. Philosophical questioning assumes this basic capacity, but it also shows that most of us neglect its cultivation. People, including, as Socrates found out, military leaders and politicians, don't really sort out what they think, and they rush to action on the basis of half-baked, frequently inconsistent ideas. In that way, philosophy invites dialogue and respects the listener. Unlike the overconfident politicians that Socrates questioned, the philosophical speaker is humble and exposed. His or her position is transparent and thus vulnerable to criticism. And his or her is not just a, a, a correct fake, because Socrates said he would like to be able to question women, of course, Athenian women didn't go outside the house, but he said when he got to the underworld, he definitely didn't question <laughs> women. And Plato really did teach women in his school. Socrates was right to say that his method was closely linked to the goals of democratic self-government, in which each person's thought mattered, and to insist that it made a valuable contribution in proving the quality of public deliberation. He said he was like a gadfly on the back of the democracy, which he compared to a 
noble but sluggish horse. So in other words, he was singing it painfully so it would wake up and do its business a little bit better. So my book is not a book of public policy or of economic analysis, crucial though both of those disciplines are to solving our problems. It's more general and it's more introspective. It aims at a better understanding of some of the forces that move us, and to that extent it offers general directions for action. But understanding is its primary goal. Understanding is always, I think, practical, since without it, action is found to be unfocused. Philosophers talk about many topics relevant to democracy. My own work has discussed political institutions and laws, making general arguments about what basic entitlements or capabilities all citizens should have in a decent society. But that's, although I mentioned that in the last chapter, that's not the primary focus of this book. The other half of my career is focused on the nature of the emotions and their role in the search for the good life. I've argued, drawing on psychology and psychoanalytic thought as well as philosophy, that emotions have an important role to play in a decent political society. Emotions can destabilize a community and fragment it, or they can produce better cooperation and more energetic striving toward justice. Emotions are not hardwired from birth, but are shaped in countless ways by social contexts, social norms, rhetoric, both good and bad. That's good news, since it means that we have considerable room to shape the emotions of our own political culture. It's also bad news for the lazy and uninquisitive. It means that we need to inquire into the nature of fear, hatred, anger, and disgust. And, of course, hope and love and compassion, too. Thinking about how we might shape them so that they will support democratic aspirations rather than eroding them. We can't avoid accountability by saying of our own hatred and fear, sorry, that's just how people are. No, there's nothing inevitable or natural about racial hatred, fear of immigrants, a passion to subordinate women, or disgust at the bodies of people with disabilities. We did this, all of us, and we can and must undo it. In short, we need to know ourselves and take responsibility for ourselves. It's incumbent on a decent society to give attention to how, for example, group hatred can be minimized by social efforts and institutional design. Even such a straightforward policy choice as the choice to mainstream children with disabilities in so-called normal classrooms has evident consequences for patterns of fear, aggression, trust, hope, and so on. We need to study the issue, in this case and many others, and then, on the basis of what we understand, to choose policies that produce hope, love, and cooperation, avoiding those that feed hatred and disgust. Sometimes we can only produce better behavior, while hatred continues to simmer beneath the surface. Sometimes, however, we can actually alter how people see one another and feel about one another, as mainstreaming kids with disabilities surely has done. It helps to start young. Philosophy doesn't dictate concrete policy choices because these must be contextual, the fruit of a partnership between philosophy, history, political science, economics, law, and sociology. But it gives us a sense of who we are, what problems lie in our path, and where we could be headed. And its methods involving respect and reciprocity also model important aspects of where we should be going. I believe it's not too bold to link the philosophical approach to America's problems with the methods of nonviolent political change as exemplified in the life and work of Martin Luther King, Jr. Some approaches to political change are violent, angry, and contemptuous of the opponent. King insisted on an attitude to others that he kept on calling love, even when what he was doing was to make an extremely vigorous and courageous protest 
against unjust conditions. Still, he said, we must approach opponents not with retributive anger, but with love. He always immediately stressed that, of course, it wasn't romantic love, and it didn't even require us to like the people. The love he demanded was a combination of respect for humanity with goodwill and hope. We treat people as people who will listen and think, and who ultimately may join with us in building something beautiful. Philosophy, as I practice it here, shares that project and that hope. Thank you.